Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome back to Chris's studio for a, a demonstration on how to work with the paints that we're going to be working with this semester. I've already spoken about the uh, introduction of the new color wheel, the new updated, upgraded color wheel that kind of shifted the uh, primaries around and uh, moved things around a little bit from the, what was the traditional color wheel, where the primaries were, of course, yellow, blue, and red. Now, it is yellow still remains the main primary at the top. Cyan has replaced blue. Blue has become a secondary color, actually a tertiary color. Um, red has become a secondary and orange is now a tertiary. So it, things have shifted around a little bit and a couple of those colors are a little bit tricky to mix and get, a, you know, get the right color. So I'm gonna demonstrate those specific colors that are a little tricky, um, specifically red in itself. How do we get red from magenta um, and also a little trick to show you about getting a nice looking violet which can be a little tricky as well so uh, let me start with um, talking about the paint itself the medium you're going to be working with is uh, you've got these in your kit gouache we've got the three primary colors which are now of course yellow cyan and magenta the new primary colors um, and of course you've got white as well and I believe maybe some black I can't remember if we included black when we add white to a color we call that tinting when we call add black to a color we call that shading and those are the only two mediums we can add to a color a hue that will change its value without actually shifting the hue itself so uh, you'll sometimes hear me say I'm going to tint this a little bit that means I'm going to be adding a little bit of white to it so uh, those are the paints I want to um, demonstrate to you the right consistency. Of course, gouache is a water-based medium. So uh, you want to get, it's going to take you a little while, a couple tries to get the uh, ratio of water to pigment correct to where we get good coverage. Um, gouache is very much like watercolor as far as the pigments and the way that they build the paint, the medium itself, but it's a lot, it's meant to be opaque. Watercolors are meant to be a transparent medium where the white of the paper that they're working on shows through and gives the brilliance to the color, whereas gouache is meant to be used opaquely where you don't see through it. And hence, you want to learn to get the consistency correct so you get good coverage. If you got too much water, it becomes, you start seeing the white of the paper through it. And most importantly, and the difference between gouache and watercolor is the pigments aren't ground anywhere near as fine so if you got too much water in the gouache it tends to look a little grainy and not very attractive so I'm going to show you the uh, correct consistency demonstrate the consistency that you want to get the paint to show you how to apply it show you some other little tricks as far as painting tricks for getting clean edges and such and uh, Let's see what else. Um, some little, again, tools that we can use to make our job a little easier. So let me start with the tools. Um, I know that we gave you a little kit full of brushes. Um, let me introduce to you the three different, the main three different uh, profiles of brush. This is, of course, is a flat, this flat profile, and that gives you a certain uh, brush stroke, brush mark as well, which I'll do a little demonstration of which each of these profile brushes, the mark that it gives to you. This rounded one that's got the little kind of rounded top there is called a filbert. Um, filbert's my kind of go-to brush just because it's got, oh, it's very versatile as far as the brush strokes you can get with it. Uh, and also you can turn it on its edge and get very thin lines as well as uh, creating this nice little profile brush mark. The third one, of course, is what we call a round, even though it comes to a nice point there. This is uh, the, the profile, if you look at it, is, is round, whereas these two are kind of a flat profile. So flat, filbert, and round are your three main brushes, and I believe you may have each of those in those kits. I can't recall right offhand <laughs> what were in those kits that we handed you, but uh, Generally speaking, for all painting purposes, these are your three main brush profiles. Um, you're going to need a palette to mix on. 
Uh, this little divoted palette is what I suggest. They come in round with, I can't believe we got two colors. You see, 10 uh, little divots, or they come with you know, square, different formats as far as this little palette goes. But uh, this is definitely for water painting, uh, watercolor, and works good for gouache as well. We, uh, gouache is rather expensive, a medium. Um, and so you, you want to be sparing. You don't want to just squeeze out a big bunch of this and make too much. But while I'm thinking of that, um, sometimes you're going to want to mix up a good quantity of a color. Perhaps your red, as because red we use to make yellow, and red you're going to be using to make your magenta red, which transitions from magenta up to uh, on its way up to yellow. So. Sometimes you're going to want to mix a better, bigger quantity of color. For that, I suggest going and finding um, these little things. Maybe you can, not can encourage thievery, <laughs> but if you go to a restaurant and they've got a little stack of these, what they call souffle cups, but uh, the more honest person like myself, of course, <laughs> goes to a smart and final little restaurant and grocery store that they, they carry these and like you can buy a hundred batches of them. They come in handy for all sorts of stuff anyway, but they're especially good for while we're, you know, working through the semester to create the paints. You can put the lid on there and save any extra paint. Uh, that way you'll not be wasting paint. So I highly recommend getting some sort of a sealable little thing. Uh, they also have a smaller version of this souffle cup that's about an inch in diameter, inch tall, which is probably adequate for that. So but this really helps you save on wasting paint, which you don't want to do, especially with gouache, because, uh, of course, we've supplied you with the first tubes, but once you run out of those, you need to get more. You're going to have to purchase that on your own. Okay. So let's see. I've introduced the brushes. I'm going to stand up now. Can you see me, guy? Mm-hmm. Oh, let me um, demonstrate the consistency that you want to mix the paint. I'll start with the uh, our yellow, primary yellow. Let me show you about how much. So be careful. Again, be sparing with this. You don't need a whole lot of pigment in that to start with. Can you see that? So you don't need to put in a whole lot there. Be sparing as you work. Um, I use sometimes a dropper, an eyedropper, to kind of get some water if I want to add. I don't want to flood it, but maybe just a couple drops there. One, two, three, four, five drops, maybe. There, take my little filbert here that I've got. And now you want, oops, you want to make sure that, now I've got contaminated brush. It's okay, I'll get away with it. I like to keep two different jars of water, one for really kind of mixing and cleaning my brushes, and one to have clean water to add when I'm mixing my paints. <clears throat> I also make a practice to keep a little blotter, a pile of paper towels here to clean and uh, make sure my brush doesn't have excess water in it. So let me see. What's the right consistency of the paint? Can I really kind of compare it to uh, if you've ever had like heavy whipping cream, how it comes out? Either that or runny ketchup. About the consistency of that, it's a little more watery than ketchup actually, but I wish I had another little trick. I usually like to have this little drop method. And add just a little bit more in there because still feels a little thick. If you paint with this too thick, it will dry up and it will crack on the surface. And again, if you don't paint thick enough, it will look transparent and watery. You want this to, and gouache is a beautiful medium when it dries, uh, perfectly dry. It's so rich. The color is just very brilliant and very saturated, beautiful finish to it. So let me go ahead and 
demonstrate here the look that you want to get. So I'm going to do the three primary colors here. I'll start up here with this little shape that I've created. You should be able to cover any pencil marks that you've made if you've drawn a shape and you want to paint within that. Just carefully push that paint out there. And I just kind of paint out to the edges as far as I'm going. I'll cover up the little pencil mark I made. I get just kind of a float a little puddle of paint out there. To where I cannot see any of the white of the paper showing through the paint. Once I've got that whole little shape flooded with a good little amount of paint, make sure I've covered all the uh, pencil marks that I've made. Just carefully push that paint in. I've got enough paint on the surface here where I can actually float it around and push it out and paint up, cover up those pencil marks that I've got. Sometimes, as careful as you are, you'll go ahead and think you've got a nice, you know, of course, we've got to let it dry. Gouache does tend to dry a little bit, uh, you know, slowly, but it is a water-based medium, so it doesn't, it doesn't dry as quickly as acrylic paints, but it does dry fairly quickly. It sets up. So, I don't know if you can see that, Kai. Does that show over this way? Yeah, a little bit. Can't turn it up too much, or maybe yeah. it'll start running. But you can see that you've got a nice, solid, opaque uh, shape there. You're not seeing the white of the paper. I still see a little bit of the white of the paper, and I can, while that paint is still wet, again, dry your brush out. Make sure you don't have any excess water in there. And make sure that you've got any little thin areas. What we're, our goal here with the point applying the paint is to get just a nice, completely consistent coverage all the way through. And again, you want it to, see, to look very opaque. Opaque for those of you who are not familiar with that word, just means it's very solid. You can't see through it. There's no transparency whatsoever. Um, this paint is already beginning to set up very slightly. Again, let me show you. While I'm letting that dry, I'm going to uh, demonstrate a couple other little <coughs> tricks that we use to... Uh, you're going to be painting a lot of little shapes that are, uh, you know, shapes of squares, you know, fine. Especially with straight lines. And we've got this little tool that we call a bridge. Which is essentially, it's just it's a straight edge, or some of these are nice, have a nice little... French curve onto it, but the main thing is that it's got these little feet that hold it up off of the surface. So you can use that as a guide if you want to, you know, cover a whole lot of area at one time, but you want to maintain those straight lines. We will take our little round brush. It's got a nice point on it. I've got a whole collection. You can never get too many brushes. <laughs> Every time I go to the art store, I buy more brushes. It's kind of ridiculous, this pile that I have. But anyway, I want to get a nice straight line. You can take your point in around. Put your, this is the ferrule of the brush, the metal that 
retains the little bristles. It's called your ferrule. And so what I need to do is rest the ferrule right against my bridge here. Lay in, see where I want to go. And very carefully. helps me pull an absolutely perfect straight line. So I'll go ahead and turn that. Sneak up there, get right on that line. Hold that ferrule against the edge of the bridge so I can pull a nice straight line. have to steady the end of my brush when I get in there and get those nice sharp corners. Be aware that this paint is still not quite dry yet so if you've got little other areas of wet paint make sure you don't set the little feet of your bridge in it. Of course this is a professionally produced artist's bridge. There are Ways you can make the poor man's bridge. <laughs> you, if you have a, a regular ruler with a little metal edge on it, take a couple of erasers or something that's a certain height and tape that to the ruler and make your own version of a bridge. But uh, for those of you who are going on to paint in your futures, a bridge is a wonderful tool to have for and if you need to pull some straight lines with paint, trying to pull a freehand straight line. So once you've got those edges defined, now you can switch to another brush. Um, let's go to a flat. Our flat is a great brush for covering field areas if you've got a lot of area to cover. Uh, whenever you want to start with it, you've got a fresh new brush, you want to make sure you get water up into the ferrule. So you can stick your brush down there, water, you'll see little bubbles come up. And when the bubbles stop coming up, okay, you've got water up into that. Water now. So, as you can see, a flat leaves a real square mark. Let me, while I'm here, just make a little mark with the uh, filbert so you can see what kind of a brush pattern it makes. So again, you can see the flat square mark where the filbert, and you can also turn a filbert on its end and pull lines with them. Can you see that guy? Mm -hmm. But as I was going to demonstrate, once you have that nice clean edge, then it's a little easier to go in and fill in your shape. Spread that paint around and create a nice perfect square edge. Now this is just a little bit thin. I can see the water. I can see the white of the paper through that. So I'm going to want to actually probably mix up just a little bit more 
color. I'll need a whole lot, so I'm not going to mix a lot there. If you want to mix that paint up really well, make sure that you've got all those little pigments blend it into the water that you've initiated and you're just going to get that again to about the consistency of heavy cream or buttermilk is another if you've ever had buttermilk and now go ahead and put another little coat of yellow on there so I get nice consistent coverage and since I've used my bridge and painted up to that edge, I don't have to go real close and destroy that, and I can get a perfectly coated. Just work back and forth. Move those pigments around on the surface till you have a nice, consistent coverage. Okay, so we've got an idea of the consistency of the paint that we want to get. Yellow, by the way, is one of the easier ones to get. A magenta and even sometimes your cyan are a little bit fussy. You need to add a little bit more pigment to those ones sometimes to get the coverage so that the white of the paper doesn't show through. Um, I found that yellow is usually pretty easy, so that's where I start. So let's, uh, let's work with cyan. Set that over there while it dries. Let's go ahead and leave ourselves a little room in case we want to cross mix between those. So again, be sparing with how much you use of the actual medium outside the tube. I'm not putting a whole lot in there to start with. And since I'm mixing these just straight primary colors. I'm not worried about having to mix and match again. It's pretty easy to get right back to those, of course. So get my little mixing filter here. Make sure I don't have any yellow paint in it. I don't want to contaminate the colors. Of course, if I have yellow paint in my brush and I mix it in that cyan, what are we going to get? Kai? Green, of course, yes. So make sure that your brush is clean when you go ahead and mix these up. And go ahead and start mashing that pigment into the water and getting it nice to the consistency I want. See a little blob of it there on my brush. I want to keep about good. Another nice thing about having bridges, some of us don't have the steadiest of hands. I've found that you can, uh, we can use our bridges to rest our hands on. I've created these little kind of side shapes, these kind of swiggly shapes here. I'm just going to go ahead and fill those in. So just so I can have something to rest my hand on and run my paint right up to that edge. It gives me a little more control. Again, I'm almost kind of flooding that shape with enough paint that I can kind of push it around and where I see some thin spots, I can just push that paint in and fill it in sure that I've got coverage so
key to get in my little <clears throat> sharp corners here. I'm going to switch to my smaller little round, my little number two. Make sure it's clean. Make sure there's no yellow in there. Okay, that's good. Float another little puddle pool in there. Just carefully, very carefully. Pull that wet paint. It's really easy to move the paint around because it's pretty wet on the surface. So you'll kind of develop a sensitivity in the, the feel that you need to move that around gently. Of course, I want to make that look perfect. I'm going to get that arc there and clean that up. Let that come down to a nice point right there. Go down to this corner. You can see a few little spots where the white of the paper is showing through. This is a great time for me to kind of go around and add a little bit of touches of it here and there to make sure that it's consistent and opaque throughout that whole shape. Gouache is one of these colors, because it is a watercolor and it dries a little bit quickly, um, it's best to paint shape to shape rather than trying to blend color on the surface. Okay. Look down on it, and I see some areas where it's a little thin. Right? So I'm going to grab where there's still some paint kind of puddled up and push it over to those thin spots. Okay, so that's cyan. That is your. Primary, primary, we're going to go to our magenta now, which is our third primary color in the new updated <coughs> color wheel. I always like to joke that they finally, science came along and had to reinvent the wheel, as they say. <coughs> Apparently, I'm not the greatest color theorist. But uh, supposedly magenta and cyan make a truer version of violet. And who wants to argue with the scientists? I like to just really agitate the brush in the water and then kind of squeegee it along the side with a, the clear glass. I can see it running pretty clear without any extra excess areas, water. Set that aside. Let me go ahead and get those pigments mixed very thoroughly. What are the components of gouache? Um, it's the binder is a material called gum arabic. And sometimes you will see, sometimes when you open up your tube with paint and squeeze out some paint, you'll see some clear liquid come out first. That is the gum arabic. That is the binder that uh, holds the pigments together as well as adheres it to the surface you're painting on. So sometimes you want to make sure I've had people paint and you'll see when it dries, there's a little dark stain on it. That's where the gum arabic was not mixed in as evenly. So just make a good point of really, really mixing that until you don't feel any lumps of the thick pigment or any little um, consistency. Just try to get it looking as 
well blended as possible. Okay, let's move back over here. bridge again so I get a nice steady hand and I'm start filling in this shape Now, of course, there's another approach you can do um, aside from pre-drawing your shapes that you're going to paint. A lot of students will just go ahead and create paint chips. So just paint big swatches of color. And when it's dry, they'll draw their shape onto that color swatch and then just cut them out. That way is another option. As you can see, I'm kind of flooding that surface with quite a bit of paint on the surface so I make sure that I get that opacity that I'm aiming for. Really want to... The trouble is that you don't really see the quality and the beauty of this medium until it's fully dried. It becomes rather matte and flat. And again, it's just once it's dry, it's such a brilliant finish and color saturation is beautiful. A little overshot my mark just a little bit, trying to get in there with too big of a brush. Okay, I've pretty much got this whole shape covered. I can see that the paint is a little thinner in some areas, so I'm going to go to these areas that it's pooled up and push it around carefully, just kind of redistribute that paint so I have complete consistency throughout that whole entire shape. little fine points I've got. Okay, while it's still wet, I'm going to grab some other, a little bit more paint, float it on there where I can see these, see these thinner places. Okay, you can see the uh, first shape I paint is almost dry. The square is drying beautifully. I can see the cyan is curing and drying on the surface. It's going to look just beautiful when it's dry. Um, let me talk about mixing a couple colors that are a little tricky to get. 
Again, these are our three new primaries, yellow, cyan, and magenta. Um, whereas red used to be our primary, now it has become a secondary. Of course, our secondaries are mixing between our primaries. Red and yellow gives us green. Blue and magenta give us violet as a secondary. And then, of course, we're going to get our red now, <clears throat> which is the magenta. And just a little touch of yellow. Of course, yellow and red make orange, right? So you're going to, once you mix up this little portion of red, once we get that red matched, we're mixing with a little bit of yellow to the magenta, you're going to need that red that is a result of that to uh, create your orange that will transition up to the yellow at the top of your color wheel. So. Make sure I've got all the color out of my brush. You don't want it to contaminate. Be careful when you're mixing so you don't contaminate your colors. Okay, so at this point I'm going to take my brush and transfer some of this magenta over into this next little well. I'm going to want to create enough to where I can, enough red, once I get the red produced to my pleasing, to my satisfaction. And I'll still have enough left over to create my orange, which is the last step between red and yellow. Okay, here's where you need to be very, very sparing. To get your red, we use just a little tiny, tiny bit of yellow. So carefully grab just a little bit of yellow on the tip of your brush and mix that into your magenta. Professor John Hood says, what does it take to get a perfect Coca-Cola red? That's still, I'm looking at it, still leaning a little bit towards the magenta side. It's getting a little bit warmer. Magenta, of course, is a cooler, cooler temperature red. It isn't definitely in the red and warm color families, but it's a cooler version of that. So I think that it needs just another little touch of yellow. So carefully add a little more. And it's still a little leaning towards the magenta. don't want to move too quickly because of course it um, you don't want it to lean towards orange yet you're gonna get orange after you've mixed and gotten the perfect red I'm getting there I'm getting real close at this point one more little shot and I think that I've got it Extra careful, be sure and be very careful to make sure you've got all that yellow pigment and paint mixed into your magenta very thoroughly so you've got a nice red. So if you can see, I don't know, Kai, if that picks up or shows the, uh, mm -hmm. the difference of the color. Can I shine a little more light on it? So you can nice. see, here's the magenta and here's your red. magenta and just little tiny bits of yellow till you get to a nice what you feel is red this color sensitivity color is like trying to hit a moving target you're going to develop your own sensitivity to it as you work your way through this color wheel what is a good green how much yellow and how much cyan make what is a really good rich green this is something i can't give you an easy formula or 
color chart and say that's perfect. It's something that you'll develop on your own eventually. Okay, let's see. Let's go ahead and paint some of that red. I'll use my little filber here because it's got that nice round profile that gives me the ability to get a nice clean round edge. And you go ahead and paint this shape down here. quite a bit of paint right on the surface right there so I'm just going to push it around make sure it's nice and opaque throughout that whole entire shape go ahead and get out to my edges cover my pencil marks once you've got that brush laying on the surface especially the filbert because it's got that nice round crisp uh, profile edge and then once it's laying on the surface you can really control that carefully paint right up to that edge lot in a little paint where it looks a little thin okay feels pretty good and consistent I'm gonna go ahead and let that dry I'm going to demonstrate one other little trick that we use for getting nice clean edges if the uh, the bridge if you don't want to bother with that another one that we use is this specifically this brand scotch called magic tape comes in little green you know plaid final dates it's a matte tape it's very low adhesive oh let's see I'm running right out of it I just ran out well anyway magic tape is a great little tool to give you nice crisp edges you can kind of mask off your edges Burnish it down just along the edge that you're going to paint against. You don't have to really push the whole piece of tape down. You just want that nice little clean edge there. And uh, let's go ahead and let me create a violet. I'm going to go ahead and paint violet in here. That's another color that's rather tricky to get here. So I'm going to go ahead and take my magenta. The reason it's a little tricky is that it, once you mix the magenta and the cyan together, those are both have a relatively high inherent value. It means they're darker, generally speaking. Obviously, you can see that the cyan's a darker color than the yellow, even though they're different hues. They've got what we call an inherent value. The relationship of dark to light we've already talked about that and you know what that term refers to so now let's go ahead and add a little cyan to this magenta until we get a really really nice rich violet some of you call it purple. Purple's okay too, but uh, <clears throat> most of your professional color wheels and color theorists like to refer to it as violet. Now the trouble is, as you can see here, it's a rather dark, dark, dark color and gouache tends to dry just a little shade darker than it is when it's wet. So what we can do sometimes to kind of just wake up the color a little bit I'll tint it just a touch just a little bit to kind of wake up the color and let you see so I'm going to go ahead and put just a touch of white down in there 
I'm going to just grab a little bit of pure pigment right there and touch it to that violet, which is going to turn it a little pastel -y, but it, it looks, it, you can see the color a little more clearly, the actual hue itself. So just a touch of that will kind of wake that purple up and make it a little more obvious. And now I'm going to go ahead and paint. If I had enough, if I hadn't run out of my magic tape, I would have put it around the entire perimeter of this shape. But this gives me the ability to kind of, again, paint right up to that edge. Not quite as technical as using the bridge. It gives you the same effect. And of course, once you get practiced, you'll eventually learn to pull a line freehand. And when the paint is wet enough, you can just learn to control that brush. It takes a steady hand and it takes a good eye to be able to keep on track, make sure you're not going outside of your shapes. <clears throat> your cameraman, my videographer here, famous Chris Kyler, uh, he does quite a bit of these abstract paintings that are just geometric shapes and he uses tape to get these nice crisp edges. I'm sure he just marvels at my steady hand and wishes he could do this. <laughs> Can Don't I you try? Yeah, yeah. Can I interject with a tip on the tape? Yes. So when using the tape, especially when you're using it on paper as you are here, I like to fold the corners, either one or two that I did not press down difficult, you know, down hard so that you can get your fingers under it when you're pulling it off a lot easier, as opposed to say using maybe an X-Acto knife to lift it up. Comes in handy, okay. makes it a little easier to remove. <clears throat> Another tip from the professional, folks. <laughs> So again, I'm just using the paint, that the wet paint that's on there, moving that around. As you can see, that looks pretty darn dark right there. That's a dark color, but I could even add just a little bit more. I don't want to contaminate that white. Another little tip about tinting paint, uh, white helps to add opacity to colors, especially when you're working with transparent colors like foil paints. Just looking out here in the field areas and making sure that there's no areas where I can see through the white of the paper. Make sure that I've got absolute consistent coverage and opacity. So when that dries, it's just going to be beautiful. Okay, now we're just uh, at the point where we're waiting for things to dry from here. You're going to want to wait till your paint is dry before you remove your tape. <clears throat> Since I see that that 
Uh, I can see it drawing a little bit, and here's my. I'm going to pull up to that edge, pull it away carefully. Get that nice, clean, crisp edge. You can see how well that. Uh, <clears throat> So I don't know, this is still a little wet. I don't think the paint's gonna run, but you can see here on this cyan shape, it's a little darker. You can see the areas where it's dried compared to where it's still drying, it's wet still. There's a few little areas where I can see a little bit of the paper coming through, but it's still pretty consistent. So that's what we're kind of aiming for. This has still got a lot of wet paint on it. This is still wet. But up here, speck of dust on it, bothering me. And the other yellow, you can see how beautifully consistent. <laughs> well, this is a good demonstration here. Now that I'm holding it up, and a lot of this paint on this mm -hmm. purple shape is running, you can see where the white of the paper is showing through. That's what we want to avoid. So again, once you're painting, let your make sure you've got those areas covered let the paint dry flat. You may still need to uh, go in there and touch up a few little areas, but again, it's going to take you a little while, a little bit of a learning curve, getting familiar with the medium, getting familiar with the different brush profiles, and getting familiar with how much water to actual pigment that you want to use to get the nice consistency of pigment to uh, carrier water. So I think that's it. That's all I meant to have to show for you this afternoon. I'll go back into class. Thank you for your patience and watching so closely. Um, I'll come back and wrap up class for the evening. So thank you.